Hi, welcome back. Uh, so yeah, we are we are ready to to start our next presentation from Andre. But in the meantime, we got another question from Margin, and the question is about uh, recycling bio-based solution and government support in material collections. But I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Andre. Uh, that uh, you are sort of answering about those questions within this presentation. Well, actually not, no, because this is a very specific question. Okay. Uh, recycling bio-based solution. Well, if it's a, a non-degradable bio-based material, then of course it can be recycled. That's not a problem. Uh, recycling biodegradable uh, plastics is more difficult because they get easily chemically degraded. And then of course the material is not that good anymore. So in principle, of course, you could recycle and you can recycle, let's say PLA or other biodegradable plastics, uh, but it is uh, a little bit more difficult. And also, um, if you want to really keep uh, material streams and polymer types separate, because that allows them high quality recycling, then of course you have a problem because these materials are used in relatively small quantities. So for example, PLA has a relatively high uh, uh, value, so it would make sense to recycle, but then the streams are very small in terms of quantities. So unless you have really a very well-defined uh, circle that you can maintain. Let's say if you get, as a producer, you get something returned to you, then you can recycle it very efficiently and profitably. But otherwise, I mean, post-consumer and through the, let's say, waste management system, that's probably highly unlikely, I would say. Okay, great. I hope much in that answers your question. If you, uh, if you have like, or any, any one of you have any questions or comments, please, Please use the chat. And right now, Andre, uh, please please carry on with uh, your presentation about the strategy and feasibility in the context of uh, biocomposite packaging. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Greg. Um, okay, so I'm I'm moving a little bit uh, ahead. Um, I was thinking about it. I'm talking about feasibility and strategy that we uh, were thinking about within the project. Uh, concerning the biocomposite materials and products. And I'm perhaps going a little bit ahead of the technical issues that we looked at. And <clears throat> let me just, uh, just give a, a very brief um, uh, point or look into that. So I'm considering in particular uh, multi-material uh, products made of paper and plastic. <clears throat> And since, of course, you can have many different combinations, let me just uh, go to the end point, just so that you can think in the right context. Uh, and the end point is that um, recycling would be the preferred method to treat this, these materials when they become waste. That's the preferred method because we get most value out of it. When we talk about paper and plastic together, most of the composite or um, um, product that we have uh, will most likely be made of paper. Paper is cheaper, so more paper is normally used than plastic. So you will have, a, let's say, 75% of the mass paper or even up to 95 or something like that. If you just think about, let's say, boxes with a little window so you can see, I don't know, pasta inside the box or rice or something like that. Normally the window is quite small and the box is pretty big. So you get the mass ratio. So paper recycling is the preferred way. Not plastic recycling because paper in a mixture of plastic really is an obstacle for the recycling. So recyclers really don't like that. So we're, we'll be talking mainly about paper recycling. So of course, for what kind of products would this make sense? That makes sense for dry products. And it can be a, a pasta box, like I mentioned, or it can be, let's say, an, an envelope with a, a window or something like that. something dry, not dirty, not greasy, not messed up with food that would go preferably into the recycling stream and preferably paper recycling. 
The other option that we have is particularly targeting food contact applications. So when you have food in such packaging, and particularly, let's say, greasy food, uh, juicy, wet food, something like that, then, of course, you will have dirty packaging that will be messed up with grease or something else or remains of food. Now, for such packaging, uh, it makes sense to take it together with the remains of the food and compost it. Composting gives us back less of the value of the material, but it's so convenient and makes such sense actually as a waste treatment option that that is that it's better to actually lose the material because you make the whole process go go ahead in a very nice seamless you know effortless way so we're talking about dry and wet applications just so to understand, because I won't go into the technical details or issues in this presentation, but rather give a more general overview of what we were thinking about in feasibility and strategy. So <clears throat> with this introduction, uh, let me go to my starting point, And I start with Central Europe again. You have it nicely marked or shown on the map here. And <clears throat> There are three points about Central Europe. It has capacity, and we can talk differently, but, but definitely in context of what we're talking about these days. Capacity, opportunity, and need. It has capacity because it produces a lot of material. It has uh, manufacturing. It's got paper and plastics, either production or processing on a relatively large scale. Uh, technically very capable, manufacturing at a l relatively large scale as well, very well integrated into value chains and so on. So it has a lot of capacity. Uh, so we're not talking about green field uh, investments, new manufacturing and so on. Uh, what exists gives a lot of knowledge and gives, gives a very good basis to go ahead. So it's got capacity. It has opportunity. Uh, this is an opportunity going into a new niche to develop it, to become leaders in it, uh, to, to become serious players in it at a, let's say, European or even global level. And one thing that supports the opportunity as well is that these are very flexible growing industries. Um, Eastern uh, or Central Europe has a lot of manufacturing, very active, and um, it, can, it can move ahead quickly, particularly when we're talking about, let's say, smaller companies. And a lot of these companies are smaller, so they're much more flexible. But of course, they might be lacking the capacity of something like, a, I don't know, Coca-Cola or Nestlé or these big, big companies. But they're very nimble, fast, flexible, and eager. So that's the opportunity side. And the third one is the need. Central Europe is lagging behind Western Europe, let's say, in sustainable product use. Partially, of course, this is linked to buying uh, capacity, just the buying power, uh, but partially also due to policies, to awareness, and so on. So there's also a need in the domestic markets to build up sustainable product use. And I think there's you know, all the potential because I really think that awareness is possibly not uh, really a problem. There's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of educated people, so that shouldn't really be an issue, but it has to be uh, somehow promoted. And I think that's actually the starting point uh, for Central Europe. Uh, maybe among opportunity, of course, we have to think as well um, uh, exports because you can say, okay, if there's no domestic market, so why would we produce this? I mean, as I said, the industry is very well linked into the value chains, also elsewhere selling to a lot of places. Uh, so that's not a problem. You can also see it as an export opportunity. Um, as I you know, mentioned before, coming from Slovenia, I normally joke that uh, whoever produces anything at, at a 
you know, semi-normal capacity in Slovenia uh, can cover Slovenia needs within a couple of days and everything else has to go into exports. And, and that is, for example, our reality, but I think not only ours. And since, you know, scale gives you, um, let's say, certain benefits and opportunities, then, of course, everybody's starting to go into scale. So that would be the normal way to start thinking about it. Um, <clears throat> Let me move ahead. Uh, but I said feasibility. So what is feasibility? It's actually a likelihood of bringing an option to function in real life. How, how feasible is it? And in our case, option is the environmentally advantageous solution in paper, plastic, multi-material packaging and other products. I have to read that, otherwise I can't. Uh, say it fast enough. And what is real life? Well, real life for us and for our project is production and use of biocomposite multi-material products in Central Europe, but as I mentioned, can also be serving other markets. So if you look at the background context when we start considering feasibility, uh, what are we looking for? We're looking for environmental benefits. We're looking for resources. Can we do it? Economic conditions. Uh, is there a use? Is there a market? Is there a demand for these products that we want to make? What do we know about it? What are the lessons learned? What are the best practices? And of course, do we have any policy around that will support it? So as a company, let's say, Looking into this field, let's say I wouldn't know much about it, I would probably go down these, these points uh, and try to figure out, like, does it make any sense to go into this or not? And if I look at environmental benefits, of course, one thing here is resource efficiency in the sense of circular economy that we've heard about. Another one is safety. Uh, these products have to be safe to use, particularly when we're talking about food contact, that they have to be food contact certified and so on. Safe, of course, functional, that goes without saying. That's not really an environmental benefit, but a more a technical one. Uh, it should reduce environmental burdens, uh, pollution, CO2 footprint, and so on. Whatever we choose and whatever fits our product, really. And we can measure most of these things by LCA. LCA really, you know, is like democracy. It's, um, it's, how is it? It's the best of all the bad solutions that we have. LCA is not an easy process, but it's the best, although it's complicated. It, it has many, many difficult points, but LCA gives us the best information on, let's say, the environmental aspects of a product. Then we can look at resources. We have paper and plastic. There are a lot of paper mills in Central Europe. Uh, plastic production is not in Central Europe because it goes in larger quantities. You, you would have polymer production maybe, but not plastic production for the main part. Uh, but a lot of uh, plastic processing, converting, a lot of that, a lot of producers, a lot of technology, very up-to-date technology, extremely efficient. Uh, so we have a lot of technology that we can already use in place and a lot of knowledge how to use it. Uh, production, logistics, trade, access to markets, all points in there. Know-how, either external or internal. Um, HR on that point, can we find people with knowledge? And also, is there knowledge support externally? Is there an innovation system? I think these are all resources that you have to consider in your uh, environment. Is there an innovation support system? What can you get from your chamber of commerce? What can you get from an association? Uh, what are the markets? What are the consumers? Do you have a market? Do you have a home market, local market? Do you have to look for exports? Uh, and so on. Of course, no market. Why produce? Uh, what is the waste treatment capacity? I started by saying about two options that we really looked at, one going into recycling, one going into uh, biological treatment, either composting or biogasification. But you have to have these facilities. If, for example, you want to produce biodegradable packaging, of course, the waste system has to be able to accept it and process it in the right way. People don't like to talk about these aspects. You know, if you have a 
biodegradable bag and somebody pulls it out in the composting yard so it doesn't go into composting and goes into incineration, well, then there isn't a lot of sense to use biodegradable plastics. So you have to have the waste system adapted. So when, when going back and looking, is there an opportunity? Uh, it has to be there, because otherwise you're going to be on thin ice. You'll be promoting something very bio, blah, 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 and sustainable and great and very good for the environment. And there's going to be a journalist that's going to go there to the composting place, and they're going to go, well, um, but I saw this go somewhere else. This goes on the landfill, for example. And then you're in trouble. How, how will you explain the benefits then? You won't. You can't, because it's not the way it should go. Economic conditions are also important. Economic capacity for investment. To make a transition, you need to invest, either in people, machinery, tests, so on. What is the purchasing power? Can anybody buy this thing? If it's more expensive, let's say, than a normal plastic bag, if you're making bags or a normal whatever product, um, what is the structure of the industry? What do you have around you? Where are the links into the value chain? Uh, are they local? Are they, again, international? Then public support for sustainability goals. This is very important. It links back, of course, to the customers, to the market, and the policy. Because ultimately, of course, uh, public pressure will move policy. Policy will not move by itself. There has to be pressure. It's either here locally or maybe in Brussels or I don't know, somewhere else, but there has to be public support. And that's very important. That's your market, that's your demand and policy. And of course, what is the economic situation? As I mentioned with COVID, we're running a little bit in the negative right now because of course, in, in good times, it's easy to, to grow, to do things, to innovate, but it's also fair to say that even in times of crisis, when you actually have a problem, then sometimes you have to move yourself. You can't be complacent and comfortable. So there's always an excuse not to do something, and there's always a good reason to do something. And maybe that's, that's also a point. Uh, if we look at the used demand, so the market, it's important to have awareness. Normally, I would say that NGOs are the most important element of building of awareness. They bring the more advanced, you can say also more radical ideas about uh, sustainability and new products, new services, how things should be, and it's right. It's right that they do that. They promote it, they bring it into public discussion, and they really create awareness. So it's important to look at that aspect. Then the next point would be regulatory support. Is there any regulation that supports your ideas of a product? Um, if there is, that's great. If it's not, it's acceptable, but um, you'll have to you know, work without help. It, it can be done, many people do it. Then what is the purchasing power? Can actually people afford it? Or would they afford it? And also how many do you, do you actually need to buy it? it? It really is a question. And of course then, if not locally, exports. I think lessons learned are also an important aspect. You can learn a lot within projects. Let's say like our project, but there are so many other projects. If you're active, if you have contacts, you can get on board projects in the areas that you're interested in. A lot of sustainability in their environment, technology, um, uh, let's say um, uh, competitiveness building and capacity building and so on. So in a project, you have the opportunity to explore something, to experience it firsthand, but not go full dive into the uh, area. You can look at market trends and players elsewhere. So you can look at, I don't know, what is very successful in, I don't know, in Luxembourg or in Belgium or in France or, or in Malaysia, for all I care. You can see how it went there, what's popular, what's moving, what's the trend. 
And how did things develop? What were the mistakes? I mean, there will be some players, early players that don't succeed and some early players that actually reap the rewards of being early in the field. Uh, so you look at successes and failures. Very important to look at that and what the reasons are uh, that it went the way it went. And then policy. What is existing policy, domestic and foreign? And we can also talk about EU level, of course, in our countries. Uh, what are the expected policies? Andrea was talking a lot about this existing and what we can expect. And there are some questions about that. But we should not forget to look at all levels of policy because you can have national, local, then industry standards, company policies, also important. If your company or a company believes that, you know, sustainability is extremely important and they'll follow that goal well, with all they've got, that's extremely important. They obviously don't need other policies because they figured out how this fits into their business model. Um, and of course, what is the support for policy implementation? One thing is to put a rule on the books, on, on paper. It's there, we should do this or that should be. But of course, do you have support for that implementation? Do you have special, I don't know, programs? Do you have uh, money available? Do you have some anything, even you know, knowledge, for example, knowledge support, uh, collection, uh, connections with knowledge institutions, uh, things like that. It doesn't have to be monetary. It has to be support, however. So <clears throat> when you look at these things, you need a situation assessment, really. And you have, of course, a lot of external factors that you won't be able to change. Uh, a lot of this, what I've mentioned, is external. I mean, nobody can control, you know, that uh, we have a corona crisis right now. Uh, but you have internal factors as well, how you manage your own company, your association, let's say. What you do, do you, do you put uh, sustainability ahead as an important uh, goal or... Or maybe not. There's there's a lot of that. I mean, what kind of personnel you keep, staff, uh, which education level, what do you expect from them? Do they need to train? Do they need to learn anything new? Or they just work? It's These are company policies and that's all internal actually. And what I've listed here is actually sort of a blueprint of what we go through with a company uh, in the paper biopack frame. That's actually how we developed our, our um, I would say, entrepreneurial discovery uh, work that we will do within paper biopack. Uh, it's, otherwise, I think it's relatively difficult to just sit down and say, okay, let's, let's look at this stuff. Um, there's never time, there's never, you know, uh, enough of anything to do something like that. Um, so I hope that we'll be able to help. Now, if we look at the strategy, how can you approach the market? Well, you can follow demand so or a market. Uh, so you're, you're looking at established competition and you're trying to go in because somebody else has already tried it and now you'd like to do it too. Well, very often, um, I mean, there are, there are benefits from that and, and great opportunities. You're safe, the risk is lower, but of course you already have competition and they've already established possibly their name, their presence, you know, their, their markets, chains, customers, and so on. And now you're trying to go in. Uh, you should. This is one approach. It's a safer approach. And normally the market, once it's growing or it's still growing rapidly, We'll need new suppliers, new new parts in the value chain. So that's a good way to go. You can be a market leader as well. You can create demand. You can create the market. You can make new niches. You will be the one forging ahead. And with any luck, you will be known as a synonym or a symbol of something new and great and environmental and sustainable that's appeared on the market. It's a difficult route. It's not easy, and that's and it's quite risky. You'll be alone. You'll have all sorts of risks around you, uh, but if you make it, you're going to be the hero. Uh, but 
to be very honest, I, I've spoken with a lot of companies and when you ask them, I mean, I, I ask directly, do you want to be a market leader or not? And many companies, not bad companies, by, by far not bad companies say, no, we're not a market leader and we don't wish to be because we don't have a capacity. This is not how we work. Uh, this is not our position in the value chain, stuff like that. They just will clearly define that and they understand it. Whereas you have other companies, of course, who want to be market leaders and they are market leaders and they fight for it. And they're, they're completely different companies, of course. Another point is also to anticipate demand. You know that demand will appear, it will come up. It's not here yet, but it will come up. You can make a mistake with your anticipation, of course. You can expect that things will happen in two years, and in fact, they're gonna happen in, I don't know, 15 years. Um, uh, we're normally, okay, let, let me say, me personally, I'm always impatient. I always want things to happen immediately or very soon, and then I get bored if they don't and desperate and so on. Um, and that's human nature very often. Uh, but I always expect that something will happen. So if you do a proper analysis, you even understand what's going on, you can go into this, let's say, with prototypes, with trials, with something temporary, even through projects I mentioned before. That is a little sort of bridge, so you don't have to really fully expose yourself, but you, you are entering the market very, very early on and, and anticipating demand in advance. Uh, there, there are, of course, different approaches in terms of products and technology. You can go into commodity, one option, or you can go into niche. It can be sufficient uh, for sustainability, sustainable products, maybe. If you have a nice niche, that's great. You can even go into a niche and make a little bit of a loss and you piggyback on something else, your established products and you know are highly profitable and you can afford to make a loss for a couple of years on a new niche, if you can, of course. Um, then when you look at technology, not much nicer to use existing than let's say completely new, but maybe you need a new expansion anyway. Then you have end of life, also technology. What is your end of life solution for the product? Recycling, composting, incineration, whatever it is, it should make sense. It has to make sense. Not everything can be recycled efficiently. Not everything by far is suitable for composting. Um, not everything is good for, uh, for incineration. And you have to identify the value chain and your role in it. That's, that's a key point, really. Um, and I was talking about external, internal um, uh, conditions. Uh, I think one key element is knowledge. Do you have it? Do you need to obtain it? Where can you get it? Are there organizations, academics, associations, whatever that can help you with it? And then what kind of support can you get? So you're not in this fight by yourself. It's not only on you. Are there projects, partners, partners, everybody needs partners, institutions, programs, anything, anything, anywhere. Um, and this is also one part of the process that we'll guide through in the paper Biopac. Uh, this looks like advertising for paper Biopac. And to be very honest, uh, it is. Uh, I'm trying to tell you what we're offering, what we will offer and how we've actually developed our services. Oops, made a mistake here one uh, slide that shouldn't be there. But I'd like to now go to the implementation scenarios uh, because these are all various elements. It'll be different in different companies, different countries, different products. Uh, very difficult to define right you know, from the start. But if you look at the implementation scenarios for, for biocomposites or sustainable packaging, you will effectively come to two scenarios. Uh, and one scenario is such that you develop um, uh, through strong official innovation and sustainability policy. So uh, this will be a very formal way. And uh, let's say you will need legislation in this case. And the second scenario 
relies on soft non-policy measures. And let me elaborate a little bit on that just to, under, to uh, explain what I mean. So scenario one relies on policymakers at all levels, local, national, regional, European, to continue and deepen in very specific ways with specific measures, the current support for innovation, circular economy, bioeconomy, and sustainable development goals. So we're effectively waiting for measures to come up uh, that will support our products. Uh, there are several regulatory approaches. If something can be prohibited, let's say, uh, I mean, even uh, multi-material packaging can be prohibited, or um, there can be direct interventions into uh, markets. We can see also the new requirements coming up for recycling and so on. Uh, then we can have, let's say, mandates for uh, the composition, how much recycled material should be in, uh, and so on. Then uh, I mentioned also, uh, for example, the end of life options, uh, easy recycling or composting or, or uh, other bio treatments. Something like that can be easily mandated. And we've discussed that. Andrea has discussed that. But the problem is you really don't have a lot of control over this. Of course, there needs to be public pressure as I mentioned, to, to come to this change. And awareness, of course, is an issue to go this route. Um, policymakers need to have sufficient information to make changes. They have to be really lobbied, to be honest. Uh, they have to be pressured by the public. They have to be lobbied. And they have to have the proper, verifiable, and um, uh, accurate information to base their decisions on. And we can see that whole process, let's say, at the EU level that we were discussing before. Uh, so there have to be also existing solutions that can realistically be applied, not just an idea. We should do this, this but we don't have a solution. It's like, well, then we can't do it because we need this product. Um, so you re you're reliant on media, NGO, science, research, as well as industry to offer workable solutions. The regular approach... Uh, regulatory approach is a long-term process. It's very hard to influence and it's unpredictable. You might have a government change and, you know, a project that's almost there, almost enter the parliament, goes back and disappears and doesn't get implemented, gets pushed back. Um, that can easily happen. It's it happens all the time, really. Uh, and vice versa, something else that you didn't expect gets pushed through. Um, very difficult to control. You can observe it. You can see it happen. You can see what's going on. Let's say it's predictable once, let's say, you get a European directive and you know this will be harmonized. Uh, you know when it will become functional and what dates, what is expected. That's really a nice situation because you can then know, but everybody knows, of course, you're not, I mean, everybody has the same information. Uh, but on the positive, I would say that we have a very positive trend if we look at the EU and our countries as well, and actually a pretty good track record. Andrea, before talking, um, uh, showed the uh, typical um, uh, sort of impatient uh, uh, environmentalist approach that I, I fully understand. Uh, so when I say good track record, I think Andrea was saying the track record is not good enough and at least not fast enough. But still, I think overall, uh, it's, it's really not bad. And if we go to the second scenario, here we go relying on a voluntary change in the packaging value chain. And this is, of course, a different story. Um, you can you can make changes at any place actually that's influential you can have a company that puts something on the market and starts promoting it uh, you can have a group let's say decide you can have retailers 
um, let's say even large retailers can decide they want to be sustainable and they're not going to have, um, let's say, single-use packaging and they'll make it possible to use something else. Or they'll implement, I don't know, biodegradable um, standards for their suppliers. They also have the market power to do that. Then, of course, another point is local government. They really don't put, you know, national legislation out but they can legislate, actually decide and make rules for something that's happening locally. It can be very local, but it has an influence and they can decide, they have the power and deciding at that level is much, 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 much faster than let's say at the international or national level. So um, this, this can move relatively quickly. Um, so you have companies, you have, you can have NGOs as well that are influential in this. Um, you can, you can intervene at any point. Let's say one option also is semi-policy is uh, packaging fees. Um, packaging um, uh, goes with the extended producer responsibility system. So of course there are fees imposed and now you can change the fees. What is the fee for a biocomposite, for a biodegradable uh, multi-material packaging? What is the fee? If the fee is favorable, you'll be pushing the market. If the fee is not favorable, of course, you'll be also pushing the market, but in a different direction. The point is, of course, that the fees should represent uh, the costs later on in the process. That is actually the new uh, requirement as well uh, in the packaging treatment, because then, of course, you will be guiding the market into a more efficient direction. So putting something on the market that's impossible to recycle will be penalized. So we believe that uh, biocomposites would be favored. Uh, I can give you an example, let's say, of what a local government has done in my home country, uh, my hometown in Ljubljana. Um, we have a you know, mayor that and and uh, a city government that supports uh, a lot of sustainability issues. And for example, you know, they at the um, city market, the food market. We have a very active food market um, in the city. And they've just legislated that only biodegradable bags can be used there. And that's that. They've decided. And here's a, a person looking at the poster that says, um, I'm not eternal, but I'm less annoying, as in like the bag is saying, because it's a biodegradable bag when this was introduced. So people could read about it and they got them for free for uh, a while. And now, of course, this is normal practice, but only compostable bags are used at the market. Same thing, let's say, in pharmacies uh, that are city-owned, same thing. Only compostable bags are used. Uh, they can do that for events as well. They can set standards for events. They have rules, of course, what applies for an event so they can approve it. And they can decide, well, it has to have this and this and this and, you know, compostable. And, uh, you know, they decide on how, what safety should be there. You know, if you should have, uh, I don't know, the police or, or some security or something like that. So they can easily also say, well, you have to use compostable uh, plates and uh, cups, for example. And you have to have um, um, collection points for biodegradable waste and so on. So... They can intervene very easily, very quickly, too. That's one option. Uh, specific measures to reach packaging change? There are actually a few. We have to provide accurate and objective arguments for the stakeholders. It's really important to work on that basis. We have to set proper alliances to make change possible because nobody will make the change by themselves or very few will, and many will fail, and that's energy lost. We have to solve technical issues. There are technical issues, and you'll hear more about that tomorrow, let's say, in the pilot action descriptions. Um, there can be all sorts of technical issues, and there are many of them, and they need to be solved. Then another point is certification. These products, let's say if something is compostable, 
or something as food contact and so on, they have to be certified. There is no way around that. It's an additional cost, can be subsidized if you, somebody would choose to do that and would ease the process, but we have to do it. And also you need serious communication with stakeholders, including policymakers, because ultimately they will have some decision somewhere. But most importantly, it's very important to understand that there are many ways to change and each will be special and different. Each situation will be different, but the key is to want to change. And we're here to support that. And with that, I'll finish and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Andre. So right now uh, we have some time for a couple of questions for your presentation. So feel free to put them up on, on our chat. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we have we have no questions so far, but uh, uh, I have a little question or maybe a comment that I would like to you uh, to make. Uh, we all live in, in very interesting times right now, as you, as you said, and as we uh, uh, also discussed a little bit. But uh, I wanted to ask, uh, how do you actually see uh, this current corona crisis, as we refer to it, uh, with regards to, uh, to our cost, to buy a composite package? Do you see it as a threat or do you maybe see it as an opportunity? Well, you can see it in both ways, because um, as I mentioned, we're using more packaging now. Uh, and maybe, you know, there's an opportunity in that because it's it's getting even worse. I mean, you have uh, disposable masks lying all over the place and everywhere. People have found them. Yes, you're 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 my idol, and I I should follow your uh, example. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I I had this here just as a prop, of course. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's my mask. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, but you see. When people will see all this stuff lying around, even more so, you know, I think that'll be another point, let's say, in support of um, more sustainable solutions. Because we were on a good trend already to do something about it, to reduce it, to make it better, and so on. Now we've fallen back into this hole. And, you know, Nobody likes that, really. You just, you know, clean your boots. They're not muddy. And then you step in mud again. You go like, oh, no. You really don't want that. You want to avoid that. Uh, so so I think it could be um, an incentive and motivation not to do this again and go ahead and change. Uh, I really think it will be that way. I mean, the way I've seen, you know, responses to all this packaging and mask and everything use uh, and and waste in particular that that just went up because all the all the indications show that and if you look around as well you see that so okay. i think it's going to be that bad that it's going to be a motivation okay <laughs> I, I also see it this way Great, thank you, thank you for this answer. Uh, I'm I'm not seeing uh, uh, many questions here, so uh, I I suggest let's do like a ten minutes break, and then we have a very interesting presentation from uh, from from Angelica Vaness about the future of uh, the Interreg Central Europe program. So this 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 project that we're doing, this uh, like final conference of the project that we're doing, uh, the project was uh, uh, was funded by the Interreg Central Europe program, a program which we uh, which we really like. Uh, and uh, the program that uh, still uh, lives on and is, of course, uh, very interesting and very useful. And we will have a very interesting presentation about how, uh, what is in store for the future of the Interact Central Europe program. But uh, let's do it in 10 minutes. So let's have a quick uh, 10 minutes break and we'll be back, we'll be back on track in uh, uh, 1.40. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Greg.